Since then, no one chooses evil knowing it to be evil, but mistakenly supposing it to be good. No one who is compelled to choose between two evils will knowingly choose the greatest, Mary Shelley once said. The light between oceans and of all about is that evil, good, right and wrong, and the struggle to see the difference between the two at times. It was written and published in 2012 by Emil Steedman, where she retraces the story of Tom Sheburn, a war veteran, and his wife Isabel, as they decide to keep a baby that wasn't theirs to begin with. The novel shows the intricacies and the impactful decision made by the characters, and shows the battle of morals as they try to navigate through, alone, isolated from the rest of the world in a lighthouse on an island named Janus Rock. But is this dilemma about good and evil only showcased in the story, or can the reader have an idea just by the title itself? More simply put, how does the author manage to show the reader the duality that exists between right and wrong, but also the need for humans to belong to a group through the prism of Seedman's book title? This is interrogation we will try to solve throughout this presentation by first of all analyzing the title "The Light Between Oceans" objectively then analyzing the term of the light before the recurring theme of the ocean. Finally, an aspect of a triangle of light and one about a match will be seen. The title of the novel reveals that light, a symbol of hope, signifies both safety and the possibility of living, surviving or healing. It also represents life beyond the sacred, as seen in the sun's light that can be both life-giving and deadly. The ocean represents a vast expanse of water. It's also a land of myths, such as kraken, mermaid, and so on, but also of dangers. Aristotle said, There are three sorts of people, those who are alive, those who are dead, and those who are at sea. This clearly shows that the sea is a kind of other space-time, where societies have no hold on mankind. The ocean can, therefore, represent freedom and the desire to live. Now we finished analyzing the terms of the title, we can begin our analysis of the title with the recurrent themes of the ocean. The ocean is important to many characters in the story, which is why it is a recurring theme. Tom is a war veteran who fought in World War I. He thus had to fight on a warship. Moreover, his first encounter with Anna was on a ship. The fact that after the war he had to cross the sea to isolate himself from the higher humans were capable of and that he had to witness is important, which puts the ocean in a protective fire role. He once crossed the ocean to commit things that enticed him, and today he crossed the ocean to go somewhere he will finally find peace, or at least to begin with. A sort of redemption for the ocean in Tom's context. The ocean also brought him Lucy, who brought him love and Isabel, who also crossed the ocean to be with him. But once again, the ocean also brought problems to him, Frank and Lucy, in a way. But we can see Tom finding his peace on chapter 3, when it says, quoted, but something inside Tom was still for the first time in years. New quote, for the briefest moment he had no edges, end of quotation. This last quote was interesting, knowing that Tom was a soldier and thus is supposed to have sharp edges to cope with war. But at that last moment, the isolation provided by the ocean managed to soften his edges. This creates a contrast with the violence lexicon field regarding the ocean, with ocean crashing against the cliffs, the water sloshed, roaring ocean. That reminds the reader of the danger that the ocean brings, regardless of the protection it currently gives Tom. Isabel lost her brother to war and had to get away from a broken family and the gracing of her small town. She found love thanks to the lighthouse, the ocean again, and cursed it to find peace for a short amount of time. She also found Lucy and managed to keep her for a while, when it wouldn't have been possible if she had been in Batageuse. The ocean saved Lucy, even if it was first threatening her. When Frank had sought somewhere safe to hide Lucy on the day of the tragedy, he went to the sea and took a boat. When he died, he left Lucy alone, isolated from everyone because of the ocean. But it saved her life when the tides led her to Janice Rock. The ocean was so separated from her mother and gave her a new loving one. Is it a tragedy or a miracle? The ocean created a sort of barrier since because of its isolation, dislocation, 
Grace was considered lost at sea and she was boring. And she stayed with Isabel, not with Anna. Was it destiny? Anna lost everything to the ocean. Her husband died on it and she couldn't get his body back to bury it because it drifted to Janice Rock and Tom had to hide it. At the same time, she lost her baby Grace and never really got her back since Lucy grew up with Isabel and was too young back then to know Isabel wasn't her biological mother. Thus, when she got her back, she only got her back physically. Lucy was still Lucy and no longer Grace. Isabel was her mother and Tom her father, not Anna nor Frank. Her memories were of Janice Rock and not Patagius. All Hannah managed to do was traumatize Lucy. The ocean is also very important for Patagius since it is on the coastline near the seabed. There are ships. Also, the lighthouse is here to guide them through the tides. The ocean provides fruits and mystery and wine. It can kill as much as it can save one's life. But the ocean isn't the only element worth the time to discuss. As the title goes, it is the light between oceans. So let's discuss the topic about the light. The name Lucy comes from the Latin word lux, meaning light, reflecting her luminous character and her ability to guide her adoptive parents. Lucy is a curious, eager to learn child, constantly exploring the island with her father. The pure innocence soothes the negative feelings of her parents. The name Grace, on the other hand, means blessing or favor in Latin, giving its bearer an aura of sanctity. For Hannah, Grace represents a blessing, since after severing ties with her husband, the birth of her granddaughter broke Septimus Potts back into their lives. Lives. Lucy acts as a unifying force and stabilizing influence within Hannah's family. A lighthouse provides illumination from maritime navigation, preventing ships from running ground, ground in challenging environment. It symbolizes the role of individual locations in maintaining the well being of those facing challenges. The lighthouse also plays a role in the life of Tom and Lucy and Isabel. On occasion, the lighthouse appears to possess a quasi-sentient quality, functioning as a distinct entity within the Sherborne family. The lighthouse is often personified as a lookout. For example, in chapter 3, we can read, All night, far above him, the light stood guard, slicing the darkness with, like a sword. In this personification, we find the lexical field of war with guard, sword, but also a simile. The lighthouse acts here as a guard protecting both Tom and the island from the ocean, from the night, and from Tom's nightmares with the help of its light. The lighthouse plays a central role in the novel. For Tom, it represents his last link with Australia before leaving for war and allows him to free himself from obsessive thoughts about this, the conflict. The island's name, Janus Walk, recalls the Roman deity Janus, symbolizing transitions between past and future, reflecting Tom's past experiences and future aspirations. Isabel abandoned her family and hometown for Tom, transforming the lighthouse into her new home and witness to her personal joys, sorrows and tragedies. Lucy's is built Lucy's identity is built around the island and lighthouse, preventing her full integration. Her grandfather merges, merges the name to symbolize his duality. Also, light is synonymous with hope. It's also sometimes synonymous of, with misfortune. Take the myth of Icarus. Icarus tries to fly so close to the sun with his wax wings that he destroys them and falls. In a way, Lucy represents that sun. Isabel tries so hard to preserve her that she destroys her own family, as does Hannah, who tries to make her rediscover her former identity as Grace. The light is also dangerous for Tom. His love for Isabel blinds him so much that his distinction between good and evil becomes tenuous. Isabel was mysterious, able to cure and to poison, able to bear the whole weight of the light, but capable of fracturing into a thousand uncatchable particles, running off in all directions, escaping from itself. The reader hears Tom's thoughts as he considers his case. Isabel's mystery is underlined by the Ethan. There are also a number of antitheses, cure, poison, birth, fracturing, 
Isabel is an unstable, fickle beacon who plays with the light as she pleases. The lighthouse and his light help guide help the guide in distress to post. Sometimes, however, it fails both literally and metaphorically. Frank's boat is lost in the middle of the sea, killing half its passengers. This is the trigger point for the actions in the novel. Everything starts with a failure. When then Tom is familiar with failure. In his family, he played the role of lighthouse and landmark. Yet it is who, by denouncing himself, sets in motion the destruction of the family he has recently built. What's more, when Lucy ends up at Hannah's house, she is desperate to find her lighthouse, which is also the land of her imagination. A triangle, therefore a triangle of light and dependence gradually forms. Furthermore, Tom and Isabel are struggling to rebuild their devastated family with Lucy symbolizing hope. Isabel's miscarriages have led to a loss of motivation and societal pressure. Lucy as a, Lucy's arrival provides hope and fortitude. From the moment they meet, Isabel sees Lucy as a miracle and forgets all about laws and morals. She considers that love's bigger than rule books, Tom. From there on, Isabel builds herself up around Lucy, who is in a way become her pilot. As for Lucy, she adores her adoptive father, Tom, as you can see in the following extract. For my dada, love forever, ever. More, Lucy insisted. More what? More ever. Ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Isabel laughed and ever and ever and ever and ever trade like a caterpillar across the page. The word love is emphasized here by the enumeration of the ever and by the simile. The author shows us the strength of a child's love for a father who is not biologically hers. Tom plays the role of guardian and mentor to Lucy, for, its, for, for it is through Tom's love and the, of the Louse House and generous work that Lucy comes to love the island. As for Tom, he idolizes Isabel. In a way, he is trying to make amends. He blames himself for taking her away from her family and her turn to live in generous work. She had given up everything, comfort, family, friends, everything to be with him out here. How over and over he told himself he couldn't deprive her of the one thing. So the child. There's an enumeration, but there are also two repartees which serve to accentuate Tom's guilt. In a way, in a way, she represents the innocence she, he lost when he went to the war. Isabel becomes his beacon and his motivation to heal from the trauma of war. Sometimes, when he wakes up next to Isabel, he's still amazed and relieved that she isn't dead. He watches closely for a breath, just to make sure. It is as great a miracle as he has never seen. The abbreviation of the verb be create, an, be a create an almost overall style accentuating Tom's surprise and wonder. This contrasts with the last part of the extract, which acts as a conclusion or a sentence of indisputable truth. The reader feels empathy, empathy for Tom. Hannah's, Hannah, Grace's biological mother, is trying to reconnect with Lucy, representing hope and a blessing while also reclaim, reclaiming Frank's last memory. Hannah aims is to re Anna aims to rebuild her original family, including her, Grace, who is, a, in a way, her last link with Frank. Post-war Australian society has also wanted a beacon, and what better than glorious ex-soldiers? Let's take a look at Tom, who was made a martyr by society and by his, and by the author. Tom is a martyr. He is a war veteran with no one to come back to after the war ended. He is traumatized, close on himself and seeks isolation from the, all the things bring comfort and free of. We can see it on chapter 1, when he finally gets his job. First quote. I mean, very tough. All due respects, Mr. Coleman, it is not likely to be tougher than the Western Front. We can also see in chapter 3 how traumatized he is. 
with the bird, but something inside Tom was still for the first time in years, like we saw earlier. But also, all his reference to living things when he was too used to death. Sounds from living things, nothing about it all. He was nearing a vortex and had to pull himself back. Herbert felt his feet on the ground and his heels in his boots. Something solid. He must turn to something solid because if he didn't, who knew where his mind or his soul would blow away to? That was the only thing that had got him through the four years of flood and madness. Know exactly where the gun is when you dies for ten minutes in your do god. Always check your gas mask. See that you men have understood their orders to the letter. You don't think ahead of years or a month. You think about this hour, maybe the next. Anything else is speculation. Then again, with more signs of life, he needed to see the glass which had to be cleaned. The great teach thought like a rug of a ladder by which to hold himself back to the new abode, back to life. Tom is very traumatized and he needs the isolation. He needs to be grounded, he needs to have his hand occupied because he is too much in the past and if he doesn't do anything, he will inevitably go back to his traumas. Yet again in this passage, we have the lexicon field of war, battling, war, rest, shatter, screech, disgruntled trumpet, predator slamming him back, launch, warring. All those quotes shows the violence playing in his mind, and how it is important that the ocean protects him. Then he gets Isabel, but she begs him to renounce his moral and uses those emotions against him. When Isabel had to pay the consequences of what she did to Lucy, Tom is the one to step in between and takes the burden and sacrifice everything for his loved one. He went to Janet's rock to be at peace after a life of harshness. But soon is forced to do something that will take all of this away. When Tom tries to confront her and make her realize what they did was wrong on chapter 24, Isabel blames Tom for everything. What in God's name have you done to us? What have you done to Lucy? You saw the poor boy woman. You saw what we've done. And she means more to you than our family? It's not our family, please. He claps her arms. Look, just do what I say and it'll be alright. I've told them it is me. Alright? I've told them keeping Lucy was all my idea. Said you didn't want to, but I forced you. As long as you go along with that, no one will touch you. Easy. I promise I'll protect you. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I know they'll send me to jail. But when I get out, well, still, you made your choice. You don't even think or steal about Lucy or me, so you don't expect me to care about the bloody hell happens to you from now on. You might as well have killed me, Tom. Killing me is better than killing our child. You're a monster. A cold, selfish monster. Tom stood for absorbing the words that hurt more than the blows. He searched her face for some hint of the love she had sworn for him over and over. But she was full of icy fury, like the ocean all around. Tom could have turned her words back to her. She was the one who chose to keep Lucy. She ignored Tom's warning. She made him change his morals. But even as Tom tried to resonate with her, she shows no remorse and she blames Tom. Tom, who is hurt again, but says nothing and still goes to jail alone for her. He lost everything, ever be even more than Isabel. We can see it in the end of chapter 24. So one last time, Tom climbed the hundreds of stairs. One last time, he performed the alchemy of brilliance from sulfur and oil. One last time, he sent a signal to madness for miles about. Beware. The island swims away from them, fading into an even more miniature version of itself until it is just a flash of memory, held differently and perfectly by his passenger. Tom watches Isabel, waits for her to return his glance, longs for her to give him one of those old smiles that used to remind him of Janice White, a fixate reliable point in the world, which meant he was never lost. But the flame had gone out, her face seemed inhabited now. He measures the journey to the shore in terms of the light. Tom deserved to suffer for what he had done, 
and he himself had hidden and heard the weapons. Tom lost his light. He lost Jane's rock, the stability of it. He lost Isabel, the love of his life. And he lost Lucy, the child he did love. But he willingly takes all of it and thus feels the form of a martyr. The book's title sums up the story, which is about good and evil, and spiritual guidance. Each person in this novel guides the other through life storms. Each character needs to belong to a group or a family to feel stable. Some characters, like Tom, are held up as heroes by the entire nation. But what about their mental health? This brings us to the notion of sacrifice. In this novel, the theme is everywhere. How did World War II heroes like Tom heal their traumas while still being exposed, exposed to glory? Thank you for listening!